So now it's time. In, in this talk, we are going to cover the, the section 4.1 of the of the book, which is the proof of the complexity bounds of Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm. And we're going to do it using Wasserstein couplings. Okay. Okay. So here's it's like a a memory to recall the Langevin diffusion, which is the the solution to this stochastic differential equation. Yeah, by the way, B is called the potential and B is a Brownian motion. And this is the Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm for short LMC, where here H is a step size and K is the iteration. So we're, we're, we're doing this. Uh, Michel got expl explain this uh, the last session. Okay. Okay. Um, before stating the main theorem, I want to recall the definition of Wasserstein distance. If we have two probability measures, mu and nu, in Rd, which I denote with that P, a coupling is a probability measure in the, in the product space, Rd times Rd. And we, what we require is that for all Borel sets, A and B, we have that if I do pi of A times Rd equals mu, of A, and if I do pi of Rd times B, it's equal to mu of B. Uh, that's a coupling. And uh, the set of all, the set of all couplings are denoted by this big pi of mu and nu, and the, Wasserstein, the square Wasserstein distance here I am squaring is mu of mu between nu is equal to the infimum of this quantity of the integral over the product space Rd times Rd of the Euclidean norm x minus y squared d pi xy where pi is a coupling. So we, we're finding the, the infimum between all these couplings. And uh, it can be shown that there exists a unique, uh, not, not a unique necessarily, but there exists a, an optimal coupling that realizes this, this infimum. Okay. So this, this is the main theorem that we want to prove. If we take k, a natural number, which is the iteration of the Langevig in Monte Carlo algorithm, and we, we're going to denote the law of the k, k iterator of LMC with the step says h greater, greater than zero. That law I'm going to denote with mu kh. And we're going to assume that the target measure pi has a density, the, the exponential of negative b, where the gradient of b of zero equals zero. And we are going to, to require this conditional equation. And in particular, this one implies that the gradient is Lipschitz with constant beta, OK? okay. So if h is less or equal to 1 over 3 beta, then for all n natural, we have these estimates. That is the square, the square Wasserstein distance between mu sub n h and pi is less or equal to the exponential of negative alpha, negative alpha n h times the square Wasserstein distance of mu sub zero and pi plus this term here, which is like zero. Okay, so the idea of the proof is that first we're going to to prove it for the is to do a, a coupling between the the continuous diffusion and the and the algorithm, and we're going to estimate the Wasserstein distance between those two. So, and here in the uh, the first step would be to do it for for the step one k the first k. Right? Okay, so we're going to assume that both the algorithm and the diffusion are initialized at the same measure u sub zero. And we want to bound this. So we're going to cover the two processes by taking 
x0 equals z sub 0, and we're going to use the same Brownian motion here, and we're going to define these two processes, okay? Okay, so now we're going to estimate this. This is the Wasserstein sign distance, therefore by, by definition is less or equal to this expected value of the square norm of x sub h minus z sub h. And then by doing some elementary computation, we have that it is less or equal to this quantity here, and this is less or equal to this. And by the, by the as I said, the, the gradient is, is lifted with constant beta. So here, I have h beta square, and I have this term here. That is because the gradient is... Nicolas, so you're not guaranteed that xh and zh denote an optimal coupling, right? Yeah. It's just uh, a feasible coupling. Yeah, just a couple, but later we're going to assume that these are optimal coupling. In the second Yeah, in the second set, when we're, when we're bounding for more steps. Okay. This is just for k equal one, okay? <coughs> okay, so we have to bound this. And well, by the definition, this is equal to that, okay? And we're going to use the, the following lemma, which, which says that if z sub t is the Langevin diffusion and phi sub t is its law, and we're going to assume that what well, we already have, that the gradient of Vf0 is equal to zero in the t operator norm of the Hessian is less or equal to beta. In our case, this holds because we have the, that condition that the, the Hessian, the Hessian of, of V is less or equal to beta and the identity, the identity okay? Okay, now, <coughs> provided that V is less or equal to one over three beta, we have this estimate here, okay? Okay, so now applying this lemma for this t, we obtain that the expected value of the square norm of z sub t minus z sub zero is less or equal to a beta squared t squared times the expected value of the square norm of z sub zero plus a t t. And therefore by the estimate that we already had here, I can put this here, and I obtain that it is less or equal to three beta to the fourth power power h ta h ta to the fourth power times the expected value of the square norm of z sub zero plus four beta squared dh cube. Okay. Okay. So now we wait. Okay, that was our first estimate, the one before, and now I'm going to do it for for k uh, larger. Okay. So we're going to do a coupling between, between mu and sub k plus one h and pi sorrows. Okay, so x k h has the hello mu k h and z k h has the low pi and this is optimally coupled. Okay, so this is an optimal cover. And using the same Brownian motion we said x sub k plus one h equals x sub so kh minus h, the, the gradient of v here at xh plus the square root of two, v sub v sub k plus one h minus v sub k, okay? And similarly here I can do this, and, and this integral from kh to t, here t is between kh and k plus one h, okay? So we have the x sub k plus one h has the law mu k plus one h, and pi is the stationary for the Langevin diffusion. So since it's a stationary, we have that z k plus one h has the law pi, okay? And we'll, we will also introduce an auxiliary process, which is this one, which is the Langevin diffusion, but started here, and x k h. Not just that, right? So x bar, is that? Yes, x bar. I forgot to X bar is, um, you initialize it at x 
kth, but also, I mean, the Brownian motion term. Yeah, it's the same Brownian motion. Ah, but it's shifted in time. Just because you, okay. Okay, so now we're going to bound Oh, this. sorry, I, I did have a question, though. <laughs> Can you go back? Because you said that these are optimal couplings, right? But yes. you're also writing an SDE for them. So is it guaranteed that the, then the solutions of these SDEs are optimal couplings? Okay, again. Sorry. Because um, you, you're saying that X, oh, sorry, sorry. The initialization is an optimal coupling. Yes. And then you let it evolve with the, with the stochastic yes. differential equation. Yes. Okay. So, so far, the coupling doesn't have a name. No, no, no. I, I was thinking that not just xkh, but xt would be, or like zt would be an optimal coupling, which is not immediately true, but it's not. Okay, so we, we have to estimate this. Uh, square doesn't sign distance is the move. So k plus 1 h and pi. Okay, and by the definition, this is lesser or equal to this. And what we're going to do is to add zero in the form of bar x k plus one h minus bar x sub k plus one h. So we we're left with this. These two terms here. I think that it doesn't matter. Okay, so this this term, this we, we want to estimate this. Okay. And by the way, those brackets are the DNA product. Okay, so we're going to estimate, estimate it with the Cauchy's fats inequality and Young's inequality, which I record there. That's the Cauchy's fats inequality, and this is the Young inequality, and we're going to use a, like a special form of the Young inequality, which is with a lambda. We're going to choose P equal Q equal two, and we let uh, these auxiliary terms, A prime equal the square root of lambda times A, and B prime equal the square root of one over lambda B. Okay, and using Young's inequality, so we have the two AB is equal to eight B's, and my Young's inequality is less or equal to that. Lambda is square plus one over lambda B square. And the purpose for this is that later we're going to choose a special lambda. Okay, so okay, so basically this we now we estimate here with the Cauchy's fats inequality, and here we're using the the young the young inequality. Okay. Okay, so as before, now we have to add these things up. So we have the square Wasserstein distance between mu. So k plus one h and pi is less or equal to one plus lambda times this, and here we will have one plus one over lambda, okay? And now we're going to use a, a theorem in order to estimate this term, because uh, as you can see here, we have two Langevin diffusion. This is a Langevin diffusion started at KH, and this one is the, the other range of diffusion starting at the beginning. And here we have the, the, the algorithm, and here we have the range of diffusion, so this term we can estimate it with, uh, with the first bound that we proved in, in the first part, okay? While this we, we're going to use uh, the following theorem, which I stated in the next slide. Okay. So the theorem says that if the great a Hessian of V is greater or equal to alpha the identity, you see, which we have that, and Z sub T and Z prime sub T, you know, two copies of the Langevin diffusion with potential V and driven by the same round emotion, then we have this estimate that the expected value of the square norm of Z sub T minus Z prime sub T is less or equal to the exponential of negative two alpha t times the expected value of the square norm of z sub zero minus z prime sub zero, okay? Okay, here, uh, we're applying the theorem, but we have we cannot apply it at uh, the step zero. We have to apply it at the step kh, because that's where these two Langevin diffusion start to coincide, okay? 
So we have the, the expected value of the square norm between bar x, k plus 1 h minus z, k, so k plus 1 h is, is less or equal to the exponential of negative 2 alpha h. And here we have this expected value of the square norm between x k h minus z sub k h squared. But we assume that the, they are optimally coupled. So this quantity is in fact equal to the, the square of Wassenstein distance between mu sub kh and pi. Okay. And we're going to use another lemma to illustrate the first point. So if pi has a density exponential of negative b and the Hessian of b satisfies this and that, we have a, a bound in the second moment, that is the, the integral of the square norm to pi is less or equal to d over alpha. And here we have the, the one step bound that we proved earlier. Okay, so as I said, we can use the the bound because x is the LMC algorithm and x varies the continuous density in diffusion. And both are each is at the same distribution move to kh. Okay. So here we have the expected value of the square norm of x sub k plus one h minus x bar sub k plus one h is is less or equal to three theta to the fourth power to the fourth power times the expected value of X, the square norm of x sub kh plus four theta square kh cube. Okay. And here we can we have this this constant here three and four. So we, we can ignore them basically. That that's what this symbol here is that we forgot to define. Uh, it means that a is less or equal to b with some universal constant. So here three and four, they, they don't matter. And here, we, uh, this D and alpha, they appear because they are, they are the upper bound of this quantity. So we have this, this as N, okay? Okay, so now basically adding things up, we get this, we get this, okay? Here, the notation, by the way, I also didn't mention it, but basically it's, it's what, so A less or equal to B with some absolute of universal constant. So basically, this, this is another, uh, another way of writing what we had before. Okay, so now we choose the, the special lambda. We're going to choose lambda equal alpha H. Okay, then one plus lambda, times the exponential of negative two alpha h is going to be less or equal to the exponential of negative lambda h. And since we have that inequality there, that h is less or equal to one over three beta, which is less or equal to one over three alpha, we obtain this bound, okay? And, this, and then we can iterate this recursion for n and it's going to imply this, which is what we wanted to prove. And, this, and uh, that's the proof of the, the main theorem. So now I'm going to prove the two lemmas that we, we have used. Okay. So this is a lemma that we have used, and we, we're going to prove this. Okay. So by the definition, we have the, the square norm, the expected value of the square norm of z sub t minus z sub zero is equal to this thing here, and it's less or equal to two, to t, uh, this thing. This is by computation, so, okay. Okay, now, using that, that the, the gradient of d of zero is equal to zero, and that the gradient of d is Lipschitz, that's by the beta Lipschitz that, that, uh, that is implied by, by this, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, 
so okay, so we have this bound. This is because these two hypotheses here, okay? So this thing, now we can estimate it this way, okay? And this here, we can use ground was inequality, which I state here. Ground was inequality tells us that if we have a function g, which is bounded g of t, let's go to c sub one plus c sub two, times the integral from zero to g of g, then I can bound it this way, g of t, g of t is just equal to c sub one, times the exponential of c sub two, t. So in our case, c sub one is the, is this, this constant here, this big constant, and c sub two is this small constant. So we obtain this ex this over bound. Okay, and now we now we're going to use that t is less or equal to one over three beta. Okay, so e sorry, uh, it's not clear here, but here it says e to the four beta squared t squared, which is this. This is going to be less or equal to e to the four over nine. That's why computation using this. And what well, this is less or equal to do. Uh, this is a number, it's less or equal to two. So this is going to be less or equal to two. And here I, I have has a and a, okay? And that proves the, the lemma. Okay. And this is the other lemma we have to prove. Okay, so pi has density exponential to the negative b, and we have this condition on the Hessian, and the gradient of b of t equals zero. So we have this upper, this second moment bound, okay, which we use. Okay, so in order to do that, we're going to recall the Lange v L generate infinitesimal generator of the Lange v process. This is the definition where this of this does Markovsonite group. And it satisfies that thing is over there. In fact, we saw that the computation before, okay? Okay, and we're going to use this proposition that pi is a stationary distribution for the Markov process is equivalent to having the expected value with respect to pi of the infinitesimal generator, generator of f equals zero for all function f, okay? Okay, so we're going to choose the function f of z equals the, the square Euclidean norm of z over two. So by computation, we have that the gradient of f of z is equal to z, and that the Laplacian of f is equal to d. Okay, so by the formula above, the generator will be equal to d minus the linear product between the the gradient of v of c and z. Okay, so now we're going to use, we uh, here we have used the, okay, the, the condition three, that condition three, we have used that. Okay, so if we translate the thing, this is, why is our probability measure, so this is equal to d, here we have this thing, and we got this, this is greater or equal to alpha d metro c over c. That's implied by the condition we had on the Hessian. So we obtain this, and, and that implies the result. But you have equality in one of these, right? The last one. Yes. Last one. I mean, yeah. that one, yeah. 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 Okay. That's equality that's by the, by the, by the condition. Yeah, it's equal if I got it less or equal. Of course, of course. Yeah, it's the thing. And that's all. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Can you put back the, the I, I, I'm sorry I lost the, the very beginning. Mm -hmm. The proof was extremely clear, so <laughs> thank you. 
but uh, yeah, which go part? back to the main result. Yes. Yeah. So you have this exponential vanishing term. Oh, this h is fixed. The state size, yeah, size, is, size, is, fixed. size is fixed. And capital N is okay. They iterate, so yes. that part is vanishing. And the other remaining term is a constant. So that's the main result. Yes, it is uh, another bound. We need to tune h in advance. Yeah. For making this small. And what's the basic n? Okay, well, zero. Let me guess. You can just take a g by zero. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure. But no, no, but uh, I mean, maybe, okay, this, this is a result for fixed step size. Maybe yeah. you can decrease it over time, and then maybe you can. Yeah, I mean, for, for every capital N, you can minimize that over h. And so I, I don't think there's anything essential about choosing the fixed step size. It's just simplifies a lot of what the, you're doing in the proof, I guess. But you could choose different step sizes for different rounds, Yes. Right? In fact, the, the book says that this is not the best, the best result. Yeah. That right. the, it's, it's a proof. In fact, it's, it's see the proof is simple, and you can prove this. But there are better ways to obtain uh, sharper results. What happens if you go to the degenerate case when alpha goes to zero? Uh, of course, this bound explodes because of the alpha cube and alpha square, but can you still do something? Have you seen any, any estimates for the case alpha equals zero? Uh, in fact, no, because I was following the book and uh, they don't mention that. But it's a good question. At least from the distance to the fixed point, I think. I mean, where, where do you use alpha anyways, right? It, it's it's in this exponentially mixing down for mm -hmm. for the dynamics, right? And, uh, can you go maybe to, there's two lemmas you presented, right, uh, at the end? Yes. So there's one of them with this exponential, negative exponential bound. Mm -hmm. The question is like, if you don't, if you just have convexity rather than strong convexity, right? Right. Not, not, I mean, this one is one of them, but it's the other one actually, the, the negative exponential um, no. No. There is no. Say again. Yes. No, no, but there's one where you got a negative exponential ah, that, that upper theory? bound. Um, there. Yeah. That one. That one. Yeah. That that you're proving a mixing bound for the diffusion when you yeah. have strong complexity, right? Mm. Uh, so I guess you. I I mean I think the other ones you use. But I think this is the one which is really essential. So, um, and the proof, I think it goes, it, it's kind of like the gradient descent proof, I think. You, 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 like if you, if you go into, can you show us the proof of this? This theorem? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's I mean, I, I think you, you covered it, right? Yeah, no, I did not cover it. Ah, you didn't. It's in the, the book, it's left uh, as an exercise. Ah, okay, okay. So uh, okay, then I guess we'll have to the homework. I, I think that this is essentially the same proof as you, as you suggested really. Is, is the coupling, I mean, you it's, you it's like... You make the, the yeah. synchronous coupling and then... Yeah. Well, if you want, I can, I have the book, yeah. and it is like a guided exercise. Uh, yeah, and I think, yeah. I, I see how this it goes. This is that the semi-group is dissipative. Exactly. Exactly, but the question is what happens in the limit when alpha goes to zero, right? Well, you have monotonicity, which is exactly the same in the quality. With alpha equals zero, you just say the, the trajectories will not get away. Mm -hmm. They need not be convergent, but they will keep at least at that distance. Mm -hmm. And then what I know from semi-group theory is rather that you have these bounds of uh, Chernoff type, which, uh, which are valid for, for the case of non -exp for uh, non-expansive No, no, no. Okay. not, of course, for non-expansive, but uh, for just monotones. Ah, okay. Uh, or, or, uh, how do you call this? Uh, and I just said the name. And, uh, dissipative, okay. but not strongly dissipative. This is strong yeah. dissipative. Yeah. No, I think it's... Uh, but I don't know if those, those results are in, you know, for standard semi-group to field space, but I don't know if they carry over to, 
yeah. to enter the time. Mm -hmm. It looks like, because as far as I can see, it's only the Hilbert structure plus uh, expectation. So yeah. Probably it works. So maybe but for a future meeting we can, we can go over this one. I think that the, the group is literally the same. You couple I mean, in this case, in yeah. this case, yes. Yeah. But I, I, if you if you carry over that proof when alpha equals to zero, it happens exactly what Robert is saying, which yeah. is you prove that things will not deviate by more than in the beginning, but you never really contract. Right? Exactly. So this is exactly the same the same trade off in the in the, the strongly complex case and the, yeah. and the smooth case in the. In the then, you, then you have this. Uh, oh. The name is very difficult. Kobayashi. 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 Mm. And the uh, Chernoff type estimate that also controls how the step size reflects into a difference between the discrete trajectory and the continuous flow. Mm. It gives you some control, of course. Mm. Less, uh, less than this. Yes, that's, that's expected. That's expected. I mean, you won't have uh, exponential convergence when half no. is equal to zero, but hopefully yes. something which is. One over t to some polynomial. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds very nice for the next meeting. If anybody did that. <laughs> now we can try. <laughs> Another thing is you could, uh, I mean, if you, so the question is what mixing can you prove for the set group? Because uh, you want to apply it to some other some problem. Yeah, yeah. For, for instance, I mean, uh, uh, potential functions which may, may, may not be strongly convex. Yeah. You were asking last time, for instance, uh, if you have this uh, yeah, like Lajasevich inequality. Yeah, I don't know. What, what, what do you do? What kind I of think application uh, would there be for, I mean, usually we don't know V. Uh, I mean, you don't, you don't know how to integrate over it, but you might know what it is. So you can evaluate it. If you want to simulate, you, you must yeah. know it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you want to I do see. Monte Carlo, you need. I mean, you, you can do Monte Carlo. I see. Or you can simulate without uh, doing Monte Carlo, but with uh, like more complicated stuff. Where in the end, the V. Uh, mm. Like you, but you could also. Why why do you care about V? Because you don't need the mixing property. I'm not, I'm not, you don't, need I don't pretend that this is uh, going anywhere, but I'm just for the sake of discussion, right? Mm -hmm. not, not because of, like in theory, you could have like a simulation or something. I simulate it, like I do whatever, random stuff, and then I can, I can prove mixing for this. Well, then you can say, okay, then the first approximation is uh, with the Langevin equation. So let's do the same we do with the Langevin equation, no? But then, so then we, here you have a mixing, you a mixing hypothesis, basically. So you kind of can say, I start with a mixing hypothesis, maybe you don't have winner to no, no, you uh, Right, right, but we don't want to start with a mixing hypothesis, we want to prove it from some other reasonable hypothesis, right? Ah, okay. that, that's the point, yeah. So for instance, if you just have a convex and smooth potential, which is not necessarily strongly convex, mm -hmm. can you prove a mixing time bound? Yeah. Which of course, it will not be exponential, but mm. you don't need that, I mean, necessarily. Mm -hmm. And so usually V is like, uh, what is an example? They don't have a I mean, very nice, for example. You could use, for instance, if, I mean, uh, if V is a loss function, right? Mm -hmm. um, sampling from this thing should concentrate on regions which have low uh, but this is um, like risk, uh -huh. right? But this is, I, I thought it was about uh, kind of physics uh, simulations, not necessarily. No, no, I mean, in the beginning of this book, uh, they cover like four different examples. Uh -huh. So, I mean, you can use sampling algorithms for, for machine learning. Right? Yeah. Uh, might not be the most natural thing to do, but, but still. I mean, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it could be some. I'm not a physician, but I guess 
It's uh, statistical physics examples where you have the ground state, which is huge. Mm -hmm. You don't want to uh, to compute the partition function, yeah. and you want you still want to simulate the state of the system. Yeah, this I thought it was. Uh, and this I gives you this type of gives uh, something. Yes. But that usually you don't have, a, that's a case where you don't have these bounds like that. For free, like these bounds like this are not. No, no, right. Uh, no, in that case, V is the, what they call the free end of Yeah. And uh, it's, it's not that much. I mean, if you have, ex maybe, maybe for exponential changes, you may have convexity of the, of the potential, right? So there's some classes which would be arguably limited, but, but still. But so, th so, there, so what I understand is here they have they assume they uh, use uh, this property to get this uh, uh, to compare two different solutions to these equations and then uh, then there is this approximation with h mm. Mm. With, with x h and so on and this other approximation is just. Uh, Oh yeah, so, see, so basically here you have some kind of very general bound and then I want to approximate it and do something else that is going to approximate my, so my, my equilibrium. So they, yeah, usually people want to care about what is pi. And so what I thought it was like, yeah, you, you, you care about what is pi. Yeah. And the rest doesn't... Uh, Because I was just thinking, does it, uh, do you, the best norm is the L2 norm? I don't know. It seems like a strong I norm. I wonder the same. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, the rest, you could do like Wasser time or like whatever you put instead of yeah. Wasser time and so on. I mean, these bounds you get on the, uh, on the Laplacian of, with this D factor, mm. and hopefully you can kill them using something else, right? You could use infinity norm instead. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know what's the analog of that, but, but mm. it's, it's but something it's that... Like if you know mixing, but not really, like I don't... Like you know this, but only for for uh, something that is not a distance. But still you can uh, do a basket time that is not a distance and do the bound that is not a bound, but uh, yeah. something. <laughs> you can uh, some part of the information. Sure. I've seen some papers where they where, where they kind of generalize the notion of Wasserstein distance using Bergman divergences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like because of its non-symmetric measure of distance. Yeah. Right? And then you could, yeah, yeah. Then maybe you could do this. But in that, in that case, you really know that you don't know all the information, but you know, I know some. Right. Like, that is not a distance. Mm. And, yeah. and so if the Hessian is like, uh, I control it only on the part on which it is a distance, it would be like good. Like it's good enough. Only the direction, like it's in 